You see this picture they got up on the screen? Yeah, that was that was a baby picture. Uh, what kind of memories does that picture generate for you? Well, it bring me outlaw and my childhood comrade Trey. Mm -hmm. But right then and there, I still had hope. Mm -hmm. That's Where been a fight. Right there, what year you think that was? Well, that's Lord. That's ninety four. That's mm -hmm. behind the wall. Okay. Yeah, for those that don't know, you know, the situation of this legal fight that we're talking about. And I don't want to stay here too long because there's many more layers of Anton White and everything else that we got to offer. But I did want to just touch on a lot of the struggles that came before that. And uh, I still, you know, I don't want to get too much deep into the, to the legal part of it because I don't want to get it. I don't want to make it a legal interview. Right? Yeah. But uh, I did want to ask a question that lead to something else. When you were first arrested, right? I'm talking about arrested and didn't come home. You weren't arrested for a RICO charge, right? You're right, correct. How was you first arrested? Well, I had a warrant on my arrest for the murder of of informer. Okay. But that charge was uh what we would call local. Well where we more, from exactly. Yeah. It was it Can was initially for me? Well, it was initially a local um warrant. Okay. You know, but the feds took over. Because, quote, unquote, allegedly he was an informer. Okay. So when you fair to say, say that the feds took over, right, what do you mean? Well, the feds took over the case mm -hmm. because he was a, quote, unquote, an informer. Right, I understand. So now he was under, you know, the guidance of the feds actually trying to sit up there and create distributions to get us arrested. I read in the Washington Post that uh, some people from the community was upset because that charge was dropped in Superior Court, and uh, they said that they didn't want to wait for the federal government to come back and give you and your childhood friends hundreds of years for being a drug organization. Is that all a part of, or do you think that that's all a part of what well, you was talking you about? Well, you know, like I said, I don't, I can't sit up there and speak on the the feds and all that because that's something that I wasn't interested in. But what I feel that they attacked me based upon my youth, hoping that I became an informer to replace that informer. So uh, can you take me a little bit through the trial process? You know, the government and the media played a lot of games with your case and trying to help the people get a conviction for you and your co-defendants. Uh, you know, how did the games, first of all, what kind of games did they play? Like, when people read about your case, people that know you or people that have read about your case that don't even know you, everyone agrees that through the government or through media, right, the games were played with your case and with accusations against you. All in all, Eon, there's no need to really explain to about what's in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm accept my blessings for the day. Whether people deem me innocent or guilty, that's their perspective, like I told you from the get-go. Mm -hmm. But like I tell anybody, I would I, I, I recommend that anybody learn their education mm -hmm. to know your rights. You know, we're not gonna sit up here and actually like dialogue about one innocence or one guilt. I'm gonna leave that to the jury again. Right. You know, the public jury. But let's sit up there and as far as people who is in the streets, man, get your education. Because when you come to prison, you don't need nobody else to read your law or tell you where you was violated at because the Lord's going to sell you out. Mm -hmm. So how were you able to, because uh, I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, I assume at 20 years old, you didn't know the wealth of law that you know now. So how did you educate or become educated? Well, more so, these things? I was always receptive. To my elders, unlike to the day, you know, they challenged me, learn law. Don't trust your demands with us, on, unto others. You know, people think that you could trust this lawyer. Nah, you can't trust these lawyers. These lawyers will sell you out. You sit up in my family, pay money for a lawyer. She froze my whole case for five or six years before she entered, as well as she pulled out based on medical issues. When you say saying froze the case, we're talking about after a life sentence while you're now trying to appeal the life sentence, right? Exactly. Ah, man, so I mean, how did that affect you in, a, in your fight? Well, like, you know, in 08, I sit up there, my family sit up there and sit up there, put their house up, uh, retain me a lawyer. I'm going to keep the lawyer nameless. She entered my case in 09. I actually was having her, I hired her because we was hearing about a juvenile issues in the Fed that was about to come out, which... Eventually did in 2010, 2011, but she never um, filed anything. 
But in 2014, she pulled off my case, claiming health issues. So now when I did sit up there and retained another lawyer, she found that the courts held that I was time barred. They said I was correct and I had merits, but I'm time barred because it should have been filed one year after the Supreme Court ruled on the juvenile issue. So for people who don't know, when a person say they time barred or something, it's time barred, right? Yeah, if you, if, if you as a person have an issue that can free you, you know, grant you all your liberties that's been taken from you, you telling me that just because it took too long for something outside of your control that you still can't obtain your well, freedom? Well, I'm going to just tell you, like, this is many people is locked up under bad law, unconstitutional law. But by we don't have the proper advocates or we're going to say a lot of people who sit up there from judges, from prosecutors, from lawyers, they actually sit up there and took an oath to uphold the Constitution. But all these is bad law, just like it's been a bill for the last three, four, five years sponsored by Dick Durbin and Chuck Grassley about the acquitted conduct and uncharged conduct that people has actually been aggregated sentence again so y'all will understand to be added more sentence to their actual conviction. They even admit it in this bill. It's unconstitutional. So again, the Fifth Amendment is being violated. But you have these judges, these prosecutors, as well as these lawyers know it's a violation. In some of the interviews that I've done with other people, that's, uh, you know, friends and families of yours, right? And even in some of the interviews we did as we were uh, advocating for the freedom of your Eric Hicks, right? Um, people brought up the issue that you was talking about for Dick Durbin and Grassley, right? And uh, one time I was asked the question why I was actually interviewing your mother, shout out to her, right? And uh, we were explaining to people that's not from where we are from that, you know, we're sitting. We're not a state. We don't have a voice in Congress. And uh, one of the suggestions that I came up with was that, you know, we have most of us that's from Washington, D.C. has family in Virginia or Maryland or other places, but specifically Virginia and Maryland. And they are states and they have a say so in Congress. And uh, I said that maybe it should be a, a movement or some type of advocacy geared towards our family and friends of Virginia and Maryland to help, you know, advocate for that law. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? It's a good idea, but I think the voice should be echoed in D.C. as well. We have a delegate, Eleanor Holmes Norton. She had been reticent for years based on the unconstitutionality of these drug laws. So, therefore, I feel that we should shape a better uh, system to sit up there and echo with the Senate. Mm. You know, if she being a delegate, that shows that she's supposed to be our voice there. Right. For issues that's bigger than just the city, because I mean, you know, whether you come out of superior court or federal court, you go where? So you're still going to go to the federal prison system. Exactly. Uh, moving on a little bit, because I, I definitely want to get to our city. A lot of people have been asking me about our city. Uh, I just want to skip to the feds for a second. So you know, in the feds, you know, with, 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 uh, without a doubt, your name hold a lot of weight as well as in the free world. You've been called things such as a, a leader among DC prisoners. Uh, you've been called a shot caller. However, I've read in a quote that you had that I've seen in newspapers and other places where you express the fact that you're not a leader of anything. Can you elaborate on why you felt as though that you're not a leader of anything and why some other people call you a leader or a shot caller? Well, let me correct that. I am a leader. I'm a leader of my daughter and my woman. Mm -hmm. So, you know, shout out to y'all. But all in all, I'm not a leader of no D.C., we have no gangs, no crews. I'm just an advocate of the code. We have no shot callers in D.C., yeah. but we do have advocates of the code that is respected. Nobody bigger than the code. So, quote, unquote, y'all hear from me. No leader, no D.C. Ain't no leaders in D.C. The, nobody bigger than the code. Uh, I actually, man, stole that quote from you for letters, letters, letters ago and used that a lot of times in my Instagram post. I posted it one time and everybody kind of like responded to it if it was law or revelation, you know what I mean? So uh, shout out to you for that. Uh, another question I wanted to ask you was, uh, do, did you ever believe that you would make it home? Always. I'm not a defeatist. I always was a fighter. I used to always tell people, if I died in prison, I died of a broken heart. I was a fighter. Never threw it in the towel. So, you know, when a lot of people go in there, you know, get a life sentence through conviction or through guilty pleas, right? 
You know uh, what? What's the difference in a guy that doesn't give up and a guy that does give up? The difference is you can see in the mentality. You know, like with me, I'm not like I say, I'm not a defeatist. So therefore, with me, I just fought. You know, like I always say, I'm sincere. I stayed by the code. Like I tell people, it's a joke with me. I sit up there, never snitch, never got slapped in the face, never been punked, never fucked a fag, and a fag never fucked me. So therefore, I stayed to the guidelines of the course. You know, I want for myself what I want for everybody else. So therefore, I never snitch, never entertain on snitching. I don't politic. So my whole thing is that I felt I was going to be rewarded. Hmm. You know, that's my spine. That's my posture. I mean, at the end, you was rewarded, though, right? Yeah, and that's why I said it. I feel blessed. That's why I told you there's no need for me to be sitting here speak about an innocence or guilt. Let the world sit up there and actually deem me guilty or innocent.